Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webcast entitled The Complementary Nature of PAP and High-Risk HPV Testing with Dr. Randall Gibb, physician at the medical director of the Cancer Center and the director of gynecologic oncology at the Billings Clinic in Billings, Montana. Following the talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation via the web using your Ask a Question box. If you should need technical assistance, type your inquiry into the tech support box on the left side of your screen and click the send button. If you are disconnected from the webcast, you can log on again using the instructions provided to you for accessing this webcast. If you cannot log back in either of these ways, please call 877-843-9272. Also, do not be alarmed if the video of Dr. Gibb goes to a still shot of the Hologic logo. We have been experiencing some technical issues here. The audio and slide presentation will remain unaffected. It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to your speaker, Dr. Randall Gibb. Dr. Gibb, the floor is yours. Okay, I think we're all set to go. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come listen to our uh, talk this afternoon. I do want you to know that I am uh, in Billings, uh, Billings, Montana, formerly from Washington University. I was just told to clarify that. And uh, we'll start our talk today on the complementary nature of PAP and high-risk HPV testing. So the first slide that we're going to cover is sort of an overview of the presentation today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the advances in cervical cancer screening, what's that, what that has meant for our patients. We're also going to uh, uh, bolster and, and uh, really understand the relationship of uh, human pap papillomavirus and, and the development of cervical cancer as well as cervical precancer. And at the same time, we're going to uh, talk about the clinical support and uh, guidance for marrying uh, the pap smear to HPV testing. Uh, at the very end, we're going to do some case studies. These are some case studies of some uh, patients that I have taken care of, uh, hopefully uh, supporting some of the uh, information that we presented uh, during the uh, session. And then, of course, at the end, uh, we'll allow you to ask some uh, live questions, and hopefully I can answer them uh, sufficiently for you uh, at the very end. So I'm going to start the talk out with just a few polling questions. I think this sort of gives me an opportunity to sort of gauge uh, what all of you are doing. Uh, so the first polling question is going to be, uh, do you or your practice perform high-risk HPV DNA testing, HPV 1618 genotyping, or both? And I'll give you some time to uh, answer. Okay, so the responses are coming in. I think we have most people answered. 50% uh, uh, say that they do high-risk HPV DNA testing. About 47% uh, uh, say that they're doing uh, both. And 3% say they're doing 16 and 18 genotyping. All right, the second question. Uh, do you or your practice use both PAP and high-risk HPV DNA testing in women 30 years of age or older? In essence, do you do co-testing in an adjunctive fashion for women uh, older than 30 years of age? Uh, please answer yes or no. Okay, so it looks like most of the people have responded. It looks like we have 75% of the respondents saying that they do uh, offer this in the practice and 27% uh, or 25% who said no. So hopefully by the end of the talk I can uh, strengthen uh, some of the 25% who said they currently do not uh, by uh, uh, giving you some information regarding the utility of both of these uh, screening tools. All right, well let's get into the talk. Obviously this talk uh, is centered around advances in cervical cancer screening. 
And one of the things that I first wanted to start out uh, talking to you about is the major advances that we've seen in cervical cancer screening really in the last 15 years. Uh, one of the things that's very hard for people to understand uh, and to grasp is that if you remember before liquid-based cytology, uh, the pap smear was done the same way for 50 years. And now all of a sudden uh, we have this big explosion in technology. And what you've seen is you've seen the development of liquid-based cytology in 1996 with the introduction of the thin prep uh, pap test. SurePath followed in 1999. And right after that we had uh, the first, uh, hy uh, first HPV test, which was DiGene's Hybrid Capture 2 test. And of course that led to some of our algorithms with uh, ASCUS. In the meantime, we've also had some development where we've now been able to use computer-aided uh, uh, imaging systems uh, for uh, the uh, pap smear, and of course, most recently, uh, some vaccinations uh, for cervical uh, uh, cancer prevention. And what we're really going to focus on today is uh, Servista, which is the newest high-risk HPV test, and its opportunity and the ability to uh, co-test or genotype for 16 and 18. So again, a lot of changes, uh, and I suspect as we continue to go down the road of cervical cancer screening, in two or three years we're going to have even further changes uh, in our algorithms as we learn more about HPV. One of the things that's Im important is to understand that when you look at the cancer, cancer incidence of cervical cancer in the United States, we have seen a decline. Uh, obviously, uh, the pap smear is the best uh, cancer screening tool that we have uh, to date. Um, and as a result of that, we've also seen a drop in mortality. One of the things that was very interesting about liquid-based cytology is back in, when it was introduced in 1996, a lot of people questioned whether or not liquid-based cytology would translate into improvement in both the uh, mortality as well as the incidence. And it actually has. We've seen a, a decrease since the uh, initiation of liquid-based cytology from cervical cancer from about 4,200 deaths down to about 3,700 deaths. Uh, as a result, we've also seen an increased incidence of detecting uh, abnormal uh, severe dysplasia on the cervix as, as a result of the liquid-based cytology being a better test. So uh, what, I want to take, what I want you to take home today is that we still have room uh, for improvement and some of these new uh, changes are hopeful in uh, further decreasing the incidence and identification of women with precancerous lesions so that we can impact uh, cervical cancer as a, as a whole. Um, so when we talk about the new, new technologies that have been uh, present in the last 12 to 15 years, liquid-based uh, cytology obviously is the, is the most prominent one. Uh, right now about 90% of all uh, pap smears done in the United States are liquid-based and nearly 90% of the liquid-based uh, pap smears are, are being done by the thin prep pap test. And again, like I said, nowadays it's not uncommon that many of our pap smears are being imaged by some form of an analyzer or imaging system. And you can see that we have the thin prep imaging system in the BD focal point slide profile, uh, profiler for uh, SurePath. At the same time, we've now seen the advent of molecular testing, and, and predominantly this has been in a reflex uh, fashion, uh, meaning when we look at ASCUS pap smears. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is now bringing HPV testing to the forefront as far as screening and using that as an adjunctive tool. Please also don't forget that the liquid-based uh, medium is also very good for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and obviously there are recommendations out there that we should be screening at-risk women, and it's awfully nice to use the liquid vial for that. So when we start talking about uh, HPV testing and adding it to uh, the, the PAP, uh, again, I just want to briefly cover the relationship of high-risk HPV to the development of cervical cancer as well as the development of cervical precancer. And this next slide is, is very important and I think one of the most important slides that we have uh, in the deck that we're going to talk about today. And what this uh, demonstrates is the relationship between high-risk HPV persistence and your opportunity to develop uh, cervical cancer. And what you're going to see is you see the green line which is the line representing HPV infection and prevalence. You're going to see that in the younger age group women, 15 to under 30 years of age, uh, the prevalence rate of HPV can be anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the population. Why are women getting HPV in this age group? They're having sexual intercourse more often, uh, they're having multiple sexual partners, and they're more likely to become infected. What is important about this curve though is most women who become infected with HPV clear the virus and, uh, and any kind of changes on the cervix resolve. 
However, what's, what is important to understand is that in the women where there is no regression and there's persistence of HPV, we start to see the development of precancerous and cancerous lesions. And so really where this becomes prominent and important is at 30 years of age of life and older. And so what we really want to uh, add uh, to today's discussion is that any woman who has high-risk HPV on her cervix or in her genital tract and it's persistent, those are the women that we want to identify and those are the women who are going to go on to develop cervical dysplasia and ultimately cancer. At the same time, the other thing to take home from this slide is we're really not going to add HPV testing to the pap smear in women under the age of 30 because one, a lot of them have it, but very few of them have cervical change. Two, most of them are going to regress, uh, I mean, are going to have uh, clearance of their infection and or regression of their cervical changes. And at the same time, we're not going to really identify a large cohort of women who are going to be at risk for cervical cancer or precancer. So now you're going to start to understand why we really recommend co-testing in the age group over the age of 30. This next slide really talks about why HPV 16 and 18 are so important and why we've really focused on identifying 16 and 18 as the major uh, HPV high-risk types that lead towards uh, uh, oncologic uh, development of cervical cancer. As you can see, 16 and 18 together account for almost two-thirds to 77 percent of all cervical cancers that are, uh, are, that are documented in the United States. And what this really demonstrates to us as clinicians is that uh, not all high-risk HPV types are created equal. And by focusing on 16 and 18, we are going to identify the two most riskiest high-risk HPV types, and we're going to hopefully be able to identify or, or place a patient at risk if she has this infection, uh, and then hopefully prevent her from going on to develop cervical cancer. Now certainly 35, 31, 33, and the 50s are important, but you can see from this slide that they represent a very small uh, uh, cumulative uh, incidence and prevalence of cervical cancer such that it probably doesn't warrant uh, testing or identifying those. At the same time, uh, this was a nice study that was done by Kahn uh, in 2006 or in 2005. And what, we, what was really neat about this study is this was the first study that looked at uh, HPV infection over time and the cumulative incidence of developing a high-grade dysplasia as identified by CIN3. And there's four lines to this curve. The, uh, what you can see is down in the bottom, the, the gray line is the HPV negative person. If you are HPV negative and you remain HPV negative, your cumulative chance of developing high-grade dysplasia is less than 1%. And, and I, I want people to understand this because this is a very strong association. So when we start talking about adding high-risk HPV to the pap smear, if the patient is cytologically normal and she's HPV negative, the chance that she's going to develop an abnormality on her cervix is very, very small. And this is why we've recommended extending interval. At the same time, when you look at women who have persistent high-risk HPV 16 or 18, you can see that the cumulative incidence for high-grade dysplasia, CIN3 or greater, was 20 and 18 uh, percent respectively, indicating that these two types of high-risk HPV were the ones that were most common to go on and develop cervical precancer or high-grade dysplasia if they developed a persistent infection. At the same time, Kahn also looked at the other 11 high-risk HPV types, and you can see that's the light blue line, and the cumulative incidence of developing high-grade dysplasia on your cervix with uh, the remaining high-risk HPV types is 2 to 3 percent. Again, telling us that all high-risk HPV types are not created equal and that we really need to focus on 16 and 18. And now you can see where the clinical utility of identifying 16 and 18 might be beneficial to our patients. So now we're going to talk about the clinical support and guidance for adding HPV testing to the PAP. When you look at uh, types of sensitivity and specific specificity for, as a screening method alone for the detection of a high-grade lesion, you can see here that we looked at conventional cytology, liquid-based cytology, and the HPV DNA test alone. Uh, all of us uh, really need to remember where we used to be uh, 15 years ago with the conventional pap smear. We were at about a 50 to 68 uh, percent sensitivity. The strength of the old pap smear was the fact that it was done every year. 
Liquid-based cytology is far superior than the conventional pap smear, and we have about an 88% sensitivity. When you look at HPV DNA testing, it's 100%. Now, I'm going to be honest. There's, there's very few things in medicine that is 100%. Uh, but having said that, what this demonstrates is there is virtually no woman who develops cervical precancer or cancer of the cervix who does not test positive for DNA or high-risk DNA, HPV DNA. Now, what is the take-home message, however, is that look at the specificity of HPV DNA testing alone. It's only about 86%, whereas liquid-based cytology is 93%. And again, this brings into the conversation the fact that high-risk HPV, HPV DNA testing alone will identify just women who have HPV infection, but not all of those women will have a disease uh, on their cervix. So again, right now, we still believe cytology to be the, the strongest uh, uh, arm uh, for screening. But again, now you can see where if we utilize both of these together, we might actually be able to improve on both the sensitivity as well as the specificity. So the next slide looks at the ACOG guidelines regarding pelvic exams and cervical cytology. Uh, I think most of us are very familiar with these recommendations. Again, uh, take home, uh, some take-home uh, messages regarding this uh, slide is that, remember, under the age of 21, we do not recommend a routine pelvic exam, cytology, or STD testing. Now, what I mean by that, though, is if you have a woman who is sexually active, multiple sexual partners may have been uh, exposed to an STD, certainly we're going to go ahead and, and, and test that patient or screen that patient given her behavior. But in a person who otherwise does not uh, engage in those uh, aberrant behaviors, you're probably not going to go ahead and screen them. At the same time, between the 21 and 29-year-old age group, you're going to have the biannual uh, exam in cytology. And then between 30 and 64 years of age, you're going to have the annual pelvic exam with the opportunity to screen that patient three years uh, consecutively in a row with the understanding that if her uh, pap smears are cytologically normal for three years in a row, you can extend interval, typically three years. Or you can go ahead and do a pap smear uh, screen and add high-risk HPV testing in an adjunctive fashion. And if both of those are negative, you can rescreen in three years. And again, this is sort of the group or category that I'm going to talk about. And we're going to see uh, sort of how we can triage some of these women based upon the type of high-risk HPV infection they have. And then, of course, greater than 65 years of age, you go to an annual pelvic exam, and you can consider discontinuing uh, uh, cervical cytology at age 65 or 70 years of age if they meet the, requi the requirements of three or more normal pap tests, and they have no other abnormal tests in the last 10 years, and they do not have other risk factors. Now, one of the things that I want you to know is that the second largest group of women who are getting new HPV infection is in the 50 to 60-year-old age group. And what's happening in this age group is people are becoming widowed or they're getting divorced and they're finding a new sexual partner. So one of the things I want you to uh, strongly recommend as an oncologist is please remember we have to screen our patients and identify their other risk factors. And if you have a 65-year-old who is not monogamous and she is uh, having uh, sex uh, with multiple sex partners or engaging in high-risk sexual behavior, that is a woman you're going to screen even if her prior history had indicated that she had normal pap smears. So again, we, we have to be very careful with discontinuation of screening unless they meet certain criteria. So when you look at the ASCCP guidelines on high-risk HPV testing, this is sort of just a nice summary. And you can see that HPV testing is recommended for the following populations and uses. Most of us, as we identified on the initial polling question, understand that high-risk HPV testing can be utilized in women with ASCIS cytology. Now, one of the things to remember uh, as we go through the talk is that when we start talking about using high-risk HPV testing in women with a PAP, we're not talking about ASCIS. So please remember that ASCIS is a standalone recommenda recommendation and indication. So any woman greater than 21 years of age who has a pap smear that demonstrates ASCIS is going to go straight to high-risk HPV testing. Okay? And I think most of us uh, use that algorithm in our practice. At the same time, if she's high-risk HPV negative, we're going to go back and rescreen her in a year. The second group is the group that's uh, women greater than 30 years of age. Obviously, this is the group where we're going to do adjunctive testing. And again, this is where we're going to use it as a co-test with the pap smear in women greater than 30 years of age to identify those at risk. 
A little less known category is in postmenopausal women with low SIL. Uh, any woman who's postmenopausal and she has a low SIL cytology, you can reflex her for high risk HPV. The understanding is that if her high risk HPV test is positive, it's more likely to be something associated with a dysplasia. If it's negative, then it might be associated with atrophy or inflammation, and you might be able to screen her uh, 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 in a year or so. And then, of course, one of the recommendations that have come off, obviously, is uh, HPV testing in adolescents, either with ASCUS or LOCIL. Again, most of us do not recommend HPV testing in this group, and most of us recommend uh, a repeat PAP because mo a majority of these uh, patients are going to have resolution of their LOCIL dys uh, dysplasia as the infection or the virus clears. When you look at the uh, ASCCP uh, genotyping algorithm, this is the algorithm now where we start bringing in specific genotyping for 16 and 18. So in this group, uh, these are going to be women who are cytologically negative, greater than 30 years of age, and then you're going to co-test them for a high-risk HPV. If you co-test them and they're high-risk HPV positive but cytology negative, you now have the opportunity to genotype the type of HPV that they have. And as you can see, if they are 16 or 18 positive, we're going to go to colposcopy. And the reason for this is I just showed you that slide from Khan indicating that these women uh, have about a 20 to 28 percent chance of having developed or develop uh, significant dysplasia on their cervix. So again, now you can see the clinical utility of ident identifying the specific HPV infection and triaging those patients to colposcopy. If they're HPV 16 or 18 negative, we know that they may have one of the uh, other 11 types, but we also know that that only accounts for about 5% of all cervical precancers. So as a result of that, we're going to repeat both tests at 12 months. And again, the most important thing here is, is we're going to repeat the pap smear and we're going to repeat the high-risk HPV test. And the reason why I say that is, if they're cytologically negative but remain high-risk HPV positive, we're going to cope with them. And again, the reason is, is now this woman has been persistently high-risk HPV positive for two years, and we're going to cope with her because we really want to find out, does she have disease on her cervix? If the pap remains negative and her HPV test is negative, you can return her to routine screening. Obviously, if she develops an abnormal cytologic result during that screening period, you're going to triage her according to uh, the type of abnormality or SIL that she has. So when we talk about cervical cytology, now we're going to talk about utilizing HPV testing technology in conjunction. I just wanted to put up a, a brief summary slide of the approved liquid-based cytology technologies that we have. Obviously, we have the thin prep PAP test and the sure path PAP test. And, and uh, believe it or, or not, from my perspective, I do think there are inherent differences and in benefits uh, in utilizing the thin prep PAP test over the sure path, sure path uh, PAP test. One of the things uh, that you can see is, is you do have an indication on the thin prep PAP test for better glandular disease detection. Uh, meaning that if you are to have a glandular abnormality, uh, the liquid-based uh, PAP test uh, by ThinPrep is more likely to detect that abnormality than a conventional PAP. And, and believe it or not, better at, at, at accurately identifying whether this is endocervical or endometrial. And that's a, a, a good indication from the FDA for that. At the same time, uh, one of the other things that a lot of people do not uh, remember is that you can reprocess an unsatisfa unsatisfactory specimen uh, on the thin prep platform if it's labeled as such. And again, this really cuts down on the need to bring the patient back for a repeat pap smear or a, re a repeat office exam. One of the big differences, however, is the fact that right now SurePath is, does not have FDA approval for um, uh, HPV testing. And I want you to know that, yes, uh, any lab uh, can do HPV testing on either of these modalities. But what concerns me as a clinician is there just has been no proven clinical um, understanding to suggest that the uh, SurePath uh, sure PAP -Pap test uh, consistently provides you an accurate HPV uh, result. And so, you know, as we start developing more and more tests uh, centered around a platform, I think it's very important to remember that you really want to have a platform that accurately works with your HPV testing. And so I do believe that thin prep has an advantage because we can either use Hybrid Capture 2 or, or Savista uh, in its genotyping platform to uh, detect high-risk HPV and know that it's FDA approved. Um, 
you know, when you look at the difference in the technologies, this is where you compare the differences between Servista and Hybrid Capture 2. And a lot of people ask questions about this, and, and one of the things, one of the easy things that I, I like to think of is when cars came out. Um, you know, the first car that was available was a Model T Ford. Everybody loved it, it got you around, it worked well. What is interesting is, is just like anything else, cars evolve, and now it'd be nice to have a Cadillac. Well, this is what Servista is. So we've had Hybrid Capture 2 around for a long time. It's been a good standby partner, but a lot of us understood that we could improve the old Model T, and that's exactly what we've done with the Servista. Here we got the Cadillac. So what happens with this is uh, uh, I think there's three important things on this slide that a lot of people uh, take for granted looking at Servista. One is there's an internal control. And what I mean by that is we now have a test that will give us an accurate reflection of whether or not we have enough cellular material in the liquid specimen to accurately identify high-risk HPV. When Hybrid Capture 2 or DiGene's test tells you there's no high-risk HPV, you do not know whether that's because there are not enough cells or because there is no evidence of infection. So this is a significant improvement, indicating that we have enough cellular material to make an accurate diagnosis of HPV infection. At the same time, the sample size is a little bit less, and, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, as we get to more and more things coming out of the vial, it's going to be very important that we use less of that uh, so that we can certainly do chlamydia and gonorrhea. If we use up the entire 10 cc's, uh, then we're going to be in trouble. Uh, at the same time, indeterminate rate is far less with Servista than Hybrid Capture 2. So if, uh, historically, when you look at epidemiologic studies, the indeterminate rate for uh, Hybrid Capture 2 is about 4 or 5%. With Servista, we're getting anywhere from a 0.8 to 1%, indicating that we have about an 80% 80, 80 reduction of getting a test back that's indeterminate. And again, very important is there's no cross-reactivity with other uh, HPV types. One of the big downfalls with Hybrid Capture 2 is that there can be cross-reactivity with low-risk HPV types, mainly 6 and 11, and this can happen about 10% of the time, meaning that you're talking to your patient and you have a false positive test she really doesn't have high-risk HPV, she just has a low-risk type that's been cross-reacted. When you look at indications for use, they're both uh, equivalent and both FDA approved for ASCUS pap results and for adjunctive screening in women who are age 30, 30 or over. So both can be used uh, for uh, all of the indications that we have regarding uh, HPV testing. Uh, when you look at the, the technology, it is enzyme-based, and again, uh, the nice thing about the test is if you, if you ask to have a specific genotyping test done, you're going to get one uh, uh, of three uh, possible results. Uh, you're going to get a negative, uh, negative for 16 or 18, or you're going to get a positive for 16 or 18, or both. And again, uh, this uh, certainly is helpful because it helps us triage those patients who might harbor a persistent HPV infection on their cervix that needs further evaluation. One of the things that we will talk about is obviously uh, once you know the HPV status, please remember that this can change and this is something that's dynamic, it's not static. So uh, sometimes you might have a patient who's HPV 16 positive, sometimes they might be HP, HPV 18 uh, positive, and sometimes they might eradicate one or the other infection. So I do think it's helpful to know which of these you have and of course uh, if they have both, then that's a, a little bit more unfortunate. So, with the end of the talk, we're going to do some case studies. And like I said, these are some uh, patients that I just pulled from my uh, uh, general practice. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask a question and then uh, have you uh, poll, uh, like you did at the beginning, uh, answering the questions. And so this first uh, uh, case study is a 21-year-old woman. Uh, she comes into the office for a routine pap smear. Uh, you do her pap smear and she has an ASCUS cytology. What is the most appropriate next step? Coposcopy, LEAP, high-risk HPV, or genotyping for HPV 16 or 18? So I'll let uh, people have time to, uh, to answer. This is not changing much. This is great. You, d you did better than the, uh, th better than the morning group. So uh, <laughs> uh, we had 100% say that you're going to test for high-risk HPV. That's great. Perfect. So we'll go to the next question. Um, this pa patient tests positive for high-risk HPV. What is the most appropriate next step? Colposcopy, LEAP, genotyping for HPV 16 or 18, 
and then I put in their vaccination. So what do you guys think? Okay, I think most people have answered. This is a great question and this is why I put it in here. So we had 65% of the patient uh, respondents say that they're gonna genotype and 35% say they're gonna go to colposcopy. The correct answer is colposcopy. Remember, in ASCUS, we do not need to know whether she's 16 or 18 positive. And the reason is, is she already demonstrates a cytologic abnormality, which is an ASCUS pap smear. So when you have an ASCUS pap smear in any high-risk HPV, you're gonna have about a 60% chance of having something identified on the cervix. So adding genotyping to that patient really does not help you and you're gonna go right to colposcopy. So please remember that the ASCUS algorithm is very different than the co-testing algorithm that we talk about in women over the age of 30. And again, I'm just gonna show you the slide that we had, uh, which was the guidelines on high-risk HPV testing. Please understand that in women with ASCUS cytology, reflex high-risk HPV testing is preferred when the PAP is liquid-based, but we're not gonna do genotyping in this population. Again, if high-risk HPV positive, you're gonna go ahead and send it right to colposcopy, just like we learned from the ALTS trial, and it's not important to know 16 or 18 status. So it's a very good question. All right, uh, case study number two. Uh, this is a 33-year-old uh, female with a history of multiple sexual partners. She even has a prior history of dysplasia. When she comes into your office, she gets a pap smear, and she has a normal cytology but she tests positive for high-risk HPV, meaning you did a co-test in an adjunctive fashion. What is the most appropriate next step? Colposcopy, LEAP, genotyping for HPV 16 or 18, or vaccination? So let's see what we do here. Okay, so we're, we're vacillating a little bit, but I think where we ended out is uh, 30% said colposcopy and 70% said genotyping for HPV 16 or 18. So the, the right answer here, if you genotype, would be that, genotyping for 16 and 18. And again, remember, uh, as you can uh, uh, see, we're going to want to identify that woman who's at highest risk. Okay? So, let's just say that we went ahead and did genotyping and she tests negative for HPV 16 and 18. What is the recommended triage for this patient? So now we went ahead and we genotyped her. She's 16 and 18 negative. Are you going to repeat cytology only at 12 months? You're going to copo her. You're going to repeat both cytology and high-risk HPV testing at 12 months, or are you going to return her, return her to routine screening at three years? Okay, I think most people have answered. We have 15% saying they'd repeat cytology only at 12 months, and 87% saying that they're going to repeat both the cytology and high-risk HPV testing. The correct answer would be to repeat both cytology and high-risk HPV testing at 12 months. And again, the, the important thing to stress here, and I'll, I'll show you the algorithm, is that we want to make sure that that high-risk HPV clears. And the reason for that is, is if it persists, she is still at risk of developing dysplasia on her cervix. So when a person is HPV 16 or 18 negative, you're going to repeat both the pap smear and the high-risk HPV test at 12 months because we want to make sure that we capture the lady or the patient who has a persistent high-risk HPV infection that can go on and develop cervical dysplasia. So very good. That's, that's, that's what we would want to do. One of the other things that I didn't mention, I sort of skipped over, you notice that I put vaccination in the first slide. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is please do not not vaccinate a person even though she might test positive for 16 or 18. So our Society of Gynecologic Oncologists have made it very clear. Please do not use genotyping of 16 or 18 as, a, as something that you would consider for uh, vaccinating a patient. So, uh, you know, in that patient who is 21 with an ASCUS pap smear and she has uh, uh, high-risk HPV, you're going to offer her vaccination. 
at the same time if a person comes into your office and she previously was genotyped for 16 or 18 and she had not received her vaccination and she's under the age of 26 please vaccinate that patient because again vaccination is one of the ways we have in which we can prevent cervical cancer or dysplasia from occurring all right our last question uh, this is a long one so bear with me uh, she's a 40-year-old woman uh, with no prior history of abnormal cytology or HPV infection. She uh, presented uh, to the office with complaints of irregular spotting, and so we evaluated her. We did, a normal, we did a pap smear which revealed normal cytology. However, we also co-tested her for a high-risk HPV test. Her test was positive for high-risk HPV, and then we went ahead and we genotyped her for 16 or 18, and she was positive. As a result of that, she went to colposcopy, and she had high-grade dysplasia. What is the next most appropriate step? And we'll give you some time to answer. It's colonization followed by surgery, surgery, or vaccination. Very good. Everybody looks like they've logged in. It's colonization, absolutely. 90% uh, of you said that. 10% said surgery. Uh, one of the things I want to share with you about this case, which is, which is an excellent uh, opportunity, is this lady ended up uh, undergoing uh, colposcopy, which identified the high-grade dysplasia. Uh, she actually had CIN3 slash carcinoma in situ. We did the colonization, and she actually had microinvasive cervical cancer. So she actually went on to have a regular hysterectomy for her microinvasive cervical cancer. And so in, in looking at this slide, a couple of things could have happened. One, I might have not have done a very good pap smear, and maybe I did not get the abnormal cancerous cells on uh, into the liquid vial. Or the other thing is, remember, liquid-based cytology is not perfect. 15% uh, of the time, we might miss an abnormal uh, cytology by doing a single, uh, a single pap test. So in reality, the only way we knew this lady was at risk for something going on in her cervix was the very fact that she tested positive for HPV, high-risk HPV, and that she was 16 and 18 positive. So I think this was a great case for me to understand the importance and the power of identifying a woman who has a positive uh, 16 or 18 HPV test. So we're going to talk about the conclusions. Uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, obviously, advances in cervical cytology and high-risk HPV DNA uh, have improved our ability to screen women more effectively and efficiently. And again, I think we've made a strong argument today to uh, tell you that the pap smear, in addition to the high-risk HPV test, is a very important triage mechanism and helps us identify women who are at greatest risk of disease on their cervix. We believe that when you use cytology and high-risk HPV together, you improve your opportunity for diagnostic accuracy. And again, the most important thing is it stratifies women at risk who might have abnormal cytology by the uh, presence or absence of a specific high-risk HPV type, mainly 16 or 18. And again, I hope as you can see that these, this progress in our, in our ability to screen these patients and utilize these modalities has been reflected in the screening guidelines set forth uh, by uh, ACOG and the ASCCP. And the other thing, uh, please remember, we talked a little bit, a lot today about positivity. Please also remember the strength of a negative test. So if a woman is cytologically negative and she's, cyto and she's high risk HPV negative, that is a woman who is at very, very low risk for developing cervical cancer in the next three years or cervical dysplasia, and you can start increasing interval. With that, uh, we will end our talk and uh, we will go ahead and uh, uh, take some questions. What I want you to do is uh, please feel free to send your questions to me by typing them into the ask a question box in the left lower left hand corner of your screen and what they'll do is they'll pop up uh, here uh, live and uh, I'll, I'll read them aloud and then of course we will uh, uh, go ahead and um, uh, discuss these all right so here's a question already um, does HPV have the same effect for glandular lesions this is this is an excellent question so uh, what I want you to take home is that 16 and 18 are the two most common high-risk HPV uh, uh, types uh, to cause cancer and believe it or not that's true in squamous as well as glandular lesions so there is no different HPV effect in the endocervix versus the ectocervix 
And I think reassuringly to uh, those of us as clinicians, it's important to understand that when we test for 16 and 18, we certainly are taking care of the two high-risk HPV types that can affect both the outside of the cervix, the ectocervix, as well as the endocervix. So yes, we do not have to do anything different or worry about the uh, uh, plausibility of not detecting a glandular lesion. Okay. Let's see, this one says, uh, for your last scenario, if the patient had been pregnant, would the standard treat triad still apply for a pregnant patient? Ah, this is a great question, i.e. weight depending upon gestational age. Yeah, this is an excellent question. And so most of us as G1 oncologists, if the patient is pregnant, it really depends upon uh, their, their gestational age and where they are in the pregnancy. Obviously, if a person is uh, under, um, uh, under uh, 28 weeks or fetal viability, as we say, uh, you have a nice discussion with the, fam with the family and the mother. Um, you know, if that uh, pap smear, I mean, that biopsy had showed severe dysplasia slash carcinoma in situ, I probably would have elected to watch her. And the reason is, is that it takes a long time for carcinoma in situ uh, to develop uh, into uh, a cervical cancer. Having said that, could her microinvasive cancer have gotten worse? It could have, but it would have been unlikely to have uh, developed into something that would not have been treated by surgical excision. So she wouldn't have gone from a microinvasive category to a stage two or three cancer in the remaining uh, 20 weeks of her gestation. Obviously, if a patient is, uh, is gestationally older, like 28 weeks or greater, then you have to weigh the benefits of um, delivering the baby early and doing further testing uh, versus waiting. Most of us would wait again uh, until we had a cancer diagnosis. So that's an excellent question. Uh, very, and we see this all the time. Um, here's a question. Do most insurances pay for combination testing uh, for screening? Well, the first thing I would say is yes, uh, but, but the person you would want to identify with would, would be your representative, uh, your Servista rep who's going to come visit you. Um, right now, uh, there is an ongoing push uh, to, we have uh, codes that help us identify when we're doing pap smears and when we're doing high-risk HPV testing uh, in uh, a year fashion and whether that's adjunctive or whether that's necessary because they've had a prior high-risk HPV test. So my, my, uh, what's happened in Montana, uh, Idaho, the Dakotas, and uh, um, Wyoming is that a majority of these insurances are paying for this. And the reason is because they're starting to understand that we're really using this test to pick up disease at the same time uh, uh, using the test to lengthen screen interval. Now one of the things you can't do is if you do the PAP test and the high-risk HPV test and they're both negative, please don't bring that patient back in a year and do the same test again because you're going to bankrupt our screening system. So we really ought to be extending the interval on those patients who are, are cytologically negative and high-risk HPV negative. Uh, here is another question. Uh, I had a patient with a negative cytology, negative high-risk HPV, and persistent postcoital bleeding. Uh, she was in her 40s. Would you cope her? Okay, so uh, this is an excellent question, and the reason why I say that is is because I think this is where I, I just spoke to the strength of a high-risk HPV negative test and a negative cytology. So again, when you look at the epidemiologic data, if your pap smear is negative and your high-risk HPV test is negative, the chance of having significant dysplasia or cancer in your cervix is less than 0.03%. So again, I would think that the chance of this patient having something on her cervix that would be picked up by colposcopy would be rather small. So I would start thinking of other things like uh, menstruation or menstrual abnormalities, maybe an anatomic abnormality in the uh, uterine cavity like a polyp or a, a uterine polyp or cervical polyp or uh, some other hormonal uh, aberration before I would do colposcopy. So no, I'd feel very comfortable that she doesn't have uh, anything on her cervix. Okay, this next uh, question is, has there been a study to show increased cost effectiveness to co-test women over 30 and reflex to 16 and 18 over an annual PAP? Wow, wow these are really good questions. Uh, first of all, I am not, a, because Servista is so new and because we've not done this for a while, 
we do not have a, a cost effect in this study to look at genotyping 16 and 18. The paper that I would refer you to would be Goldie's paper uh, out of Hopkins. And what this paper did is it actually looked at the opportunity between liquid-based, conventional, and liquid-based with HPV testing. And what you'll see in Goldie's paper is, is that the addition of uh, high-risk HPV testing to uh, cytology is, a cost is cost effective if we do what? Lengthen interval. Okay, so uh, actually when you look at standard liquid-based cytology, we spend about $200,000 to find every one cancer. If you use cytology and high-risk HPV testing, it's a little bit more costly up front, but you actually decrease the, the amount of money per cancer to about 80000 And the reason is, is because you don't screen them year two and three until they come back. If you actually do not listen to anything I said and you screen them every year with pap smears and high-risk HPV testing, you will now go to $2.2 million per cervical cancer. So that's why I really want to stress, please do not do this annually. Uh, if you're uncomfortable, you can certainly go to an annual pap, but again, utilizing uh, a liquid-based cytology and high-risk HPV testing has, has been shown to be effective. We'll have to wait for 16 and 18 here over the next year or two. I expect that data soon. And again, the other thing is, is we really have to see how many incident uh, high-grade dysplasias we pick up. All right. I don't think I see any more questions. I want to thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule today. And I, I hope we uh, all learned something. At the same time, I always say if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to contact your representative and they can get a hold of me uh, privately or personally. At the same time, I'm very easy to find on the web and I'd be happy to share any off-web com off, uh, uh, comments with you. Uh, thank you and have a great day.